Praise the Lord. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. You know, I get here, I'm telling you, on Sunday mornings and just worship with you, my church family. I love you so much. And I, I just wonder, I know I'm your pastor, but I wonder why aren't people just running to fill this place up every Sunday, right? And I'm speaking to the proverbial choir, but way to go. Many of you are inviting a lot of friends. Some of you are new today, and we welcome you. And some of you, again, online, we're so glad that you're here on a day that just screams his glory and his love for us and how wonderful he is. But we are experiencing some exciting days here uh, in this Lenten season. It's the Easter season now. We had Ash Wednesday service a week ago, and it was powerful. We're thinking about uh, what it is to confess our sins, to repent enter into restraint, resistance, something we don't talk a lot about around here, uh, you know, in North Dallas too much. But um, the Lord is blessing us. I know we're, we're bringing out more and more chairs in the Great Hall and across our service today in the uh, in Espanol service, in fact. Uh, we're going to have um, all of our members from, we have a couple of locations now. You may not know that. Everybody together, big, big uh, luncheon today, later on this afternoon. I think there might even be a soccer game going on, football, I think is happening. So just a lot of great things, and I just want to celebrate with you. But here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask a question, a big question, as we dive into the message today. Um, what do you think is the greatest need of the human heart? What's the greatest cry of the human heart? If I were to say, what is your greatest need today? What would, you, what would you say? I mean, deep in your soul, I think if we had enough time to think about it, most of us, I think, would probably come to this. I think we would say it's to be loved, really. I mean, you can say it in a lot of different ways. We all have this great need and desire to be loved. But coupled with that, think about this, or maybe even before that, is the desire to be known. To be known and loved, right? If I don't really know you, I could love you. I could extend grace to you. But to be fully known and fully loved, well, that is something altogether different. I was, um, when, I remember when I first experienced this, I went off to college about five hours away, drive away from home. I grew up in, you know, same home, same house, uh, same place, parents, friends, all the things, had my best, closest friends. Growing up, I have friends that I still, I'm doing the, I'm doing the dwell reading plan with a group of friends. Um, one of them I've known since I was two years old. And um, just a gift, you know, right? When you have friends like that. I went off to college. Some of you have experienced this. I didn't know anybody, really. There might have been a couple of kids from my high school, but I didn't know them. But I remember then, even as an 18-year-old, thinking, it's not just that I don't know anybody, but, right? Nobody knows me. And maybe I understood, perhaps, intuitively, I don't know, that, so how can anybody really like me or love me? Because they don't even know me. Well, then years ago, I mean, years later, in fact, recently, uh, Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller, articulated what I now know was at the crux of my loneliness throughout my uh, first semester, in particular, of my freshman year. He writes this, here it is. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like God, our being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. Now, last week, uh, Pastor Rodney told us, reminded us that in this case, often we are our worst enemies because we want to be known or we think if you're tracking with me, you know, I've got to be known if I'm going to be loved, but I am going to hide out a bit. And we all do this in varying degrees. We talked about how we keep secrets because our greatest fear is to be known and not loved. And so many of us, even today, in a crowd this size or coming to church, or some of us wrestle with a real social anxiety even. And sometimes underneath that, our fear of being in front of others, and I mean like one-on-one -on -one or certain people in our life, a fear of being rejected. And, and this fear can drive us and guide our lives. 
But the Lord has designed us first to find that we are fully known, fully loved by him, but also in Christian community, we can be known and loved. I was talking to one of our single adult, adult uh, members this week who was saying, well, yeah, you know, in marriage, you can be fully known and fully loved. But here's the thing. You can be in a marriage. This could get real tender for some of us. You can be in a marriage and not be fully known and thus not fully loved. Partly, again, because you may be hiding out, hiding some secrets from a spouse or from a close friend. But in Christian friendships, single or married, we can be fully known and fully loved. But ultimately, God himself is the one who knows us and loves us. How does that impact my life on a daily basis? Some of you are reading, I trust most of you, are reading through our dwell reading plan. And I just want to challenge you with this. Not just do this, okay? Because as a church family, we're walking through the word of God together. But I want to encourage you to do what I'm doing. With others, with friends, with with a spouse, if you're not married, with other friends. I mean, I've got a group of core friends. I mean, we're texting every morning saying, wow, here's what jumped out at me. Oh, that's fantastic. Here's what I'm doing. How are we going to apply this today? And then we're doing it with our staff team, our ministers. And I trust you're doing it in your connect groups as well. But if you're a member of this church, or even if you're watching online, if you're not a member, I hope that you'll join us. But this is what we're doing as a church family because we believe to abide in his word and then to talk about how he's teaching us and guiding us together is what helps each of us to be encouraged in him, to be seen and known, to be heard and understood, to be judged that is tested or weighed and yet accepted. That's what we're all longing for. It can happen in Christian friendship, but today we're going to see how God has set us free in Christ to live this way. He not only sympathizes with us, he is our substitute. So if you've been with us, uh, we started out the year going through the I am statements of Jesus, where we said, let's let Jesus in his own words tell us who he is. And now we're walking through the six trials of Jesus, where we're now allowing him to tell us who we are. Because again, not only did he walk through all of his suffering on the cross, here's the premise. Yes, that was the, the ultimate right, moment of sacrifice and death so that we wouldn't have to die, so that he would be our substitute taking on our sin. But he suffered and was our substitute all the way up to the cross, particularly during Holy Week and now during the last night of his life prior to his crucifixion. We're going to see how, again, he is our substitute and he sympathizes with us. He is with us. So turn to Matthew chapter 26. Here we go. Matthew 26. We're going to dive into verses 57 through 68 after that kind of set up. And now I want to place this in context. This is so important. I've been teaching a class on how to read your Bible and we've talked about how to apply the Bible, but until you understand the context What we're seeing a lot in our day, a verse can become a pretext, a text becomes a pretext, that is whatever I want it to say if we take it out of context. And so we have to understand some history. So as you're turning there, I want to give you, and so hang with me here. There's three different religious trials. There's three civil trials. What's happening is he went, he was before Annas last last week and today he's going to be before Caiaphas, his son-in-law. And um, he's ultimately going to find his way before Pilate, back to Herod, then back to Pilate for conviction. Because the Jews are trying to pin him with something that they can claim is worthy of death. But only the Romans, you might know, can issue uh, or convict someone of capital punishment and then carry it out. Because, of course, Israel is this occupied um, land, right, where, where Rome is the ultimate authority. And so they're trying to pin Jesus with something, some crime punishable by death. Now, again, Pastor Rodney last week uh, did a great job, a compelling uh, job laying out in brief the history there between Annas and Jesus. It didn't just start this week. And then Annas is this, um, the high priest, okay? But he's been replaced by Rome. It's a very political position. 
Uh, he's been replaced by Roman Caiaphas, his son-in-law. So they've been working a deal. His son-in-law now is the acting high priest. Is why we see Anna still at play because the Jews think, no, only God can fire a high priest, not the Romans. Anna is still the high priest, but they're all in this together. And he noted last week, there's a lot of nepotism going on. Annas has five sons who end up being high priests along the way. Annas is the one who implemented uh, the, the buying, purchasing of sacrifices on the temple ground where he's making some money on Monday, the, the week of this particular trial, on this night, Jesus had turned that business upside down, literally. So Annas, he's had it out for Jesus for a long time. All of these political leaders want him dead. And what we have here, Rodney noted that, that, that really this Annas' family, this whole thing is more like a mob family than it is the priesthood, where Annas becomes kind of the godfather over it all. And you don't mess with these guys. This is what happens when you have religious fervor combined with political power. Things get crazy. And, here's what, and this is what we see here. So they, they first need an informant. They need someone on the inside where they can get Jesus, arrest Jesus, and for something in particular. And of course, they find one in Judas who sells out to them. And, and, and like the Annas trial, this is not a trial per se. Um, our, our attorneys here could help us uh, to understand this even further. But this is more like a hearing. They're bringing witnesses forward. They're trying to find, they're asking all kinds of questions before uh, with, with Jesus there, but, but with others coming in, in and out all night. And what we're going to see is that there are three kinds of interactions Jesus experiences for us so that we don't have to experience them, okay? The first one is to be seen but not known. Again, one of the greatest fears in our lives. Look at verse 57 with all that. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. Okay, now, there's scribes. These are... Yeah, they're very religious people, but this, these are like attorneys, okay? And then you have the elders. There's 70 elders, which is like the Supreme Court, okay? Doesn't seem they're all here at this time. This is a mock trial. There's a lot, this is an illegitimate trial and for a lot of different reasons. They're trying to keep the law, and we know the law very well, by the way, through Deuteronomy, but we also know it through the Mishnah, a detailing of the law and what they're, what they're to do here. We know very clearly what they're supposed to be doing. And they're trying to follow along. But now we see uh, this group is coming together. Look at verse 58. And Peter, wow, was following him at a distance. As far as the courtyard of the high priest. So he's right outside of Caiaphas' house. And then going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Look at that phrase, to see the end. Peter knew that the end was coming. Jesus had said he's going to die. And now after the Lord's Supper, he's arrested in the garden. And Peter knows he's now been taken. He's scared, but he's grieving. And he's there to see the end from afar. And I say that, he's stepped into the room now. Pretty courageous move on his part. Caiaphas is there to see the end. He becomes the agent of the ending. Both see Jesus both have got him wrong. Peter had come to believe that he's Messiah and proclaimed him as such. Caiaphas, you may know, in John chapter 11, verse 51, said that Jesus would die for the nation. He was saying it's better for one man to die than, than many to die. Both Caiaphas and Peter knew Jesus was supposed to die. But look at this. They both saw him. They didn't know him. Not fully and there are two applications here. Like Peter and Caiaphas, we can see Jesus and not really know him. We can worship him. We could sing to him and not know him. We could go to church and not know him. We can read the Bible. People have read the Bible and don't know him. We, we, can, we, can, we can see him, even understand. This is that time of the year. You know, there's going to be a Newsweek magazine or some magazine's going to come out. There's going to be a special edition at your grocery store and it's going to have a, a face of Jesus on it. And say, who is Jesus? And they do it every Easter. And they go to the historical Jesus. 
because every, evidently people want to buy that, figure out who he is. You can figure out who he is to a degree historically and not know him. And so the question would be begged for some of us here today, how would you know? Well, you've made a decision to trust him. You have believed in what he's accomplished for you on the cross. But even more than that, not just intellectual assent, you actually have, have determined he's going to be Lord of your life. You're abiding in him. And could, could, I, could I challenge you a little bit? Your prayer life will reveal whether you know him or not. You talk to people you know and want to get to know. How about that? There's a leaning towards knowing him more. There's a desire in you. Are you in his word? That's a sign. Do you know him? And do you desire to know him more and more? We read it in our dwell reading plan this week. It's been fun. We've been back in Luke. We've been back in the East uh, Christmas story. But in Luke, it says that, that, that the word of God came to the shepherds and then they went. Then they saw him. By faith, they heard the word and then they saw him. This is a picture of life with Jesus. We see his word, the truth. Faith precedes sight. We believe and we see. Do you believe today? Have you received his grace? Because you might see him, but you don't know him. But there's a second application here already. We too can often be seen and not known. This happens for all of us. Again, uh, single people here, you might feel that you're seen but not known in a subculture in Christianity where often it seems that we idolize marriage as like the ultimate thing when in fact single adults, all of us are full and complete in Christ. Whether we're married or not, we can be fully known and fully seen, not just by him, but by other believers, other friends in our lives. Single or not. In fact, how about this? You can be in a marriage and not be fully known. That might be partly your fault, right? Hiding out. But you can be known and not loved. Even in the covenant of marriage. And I know this, again, gets tender for some of us. And sometimes we, we just refuse to allow other people to get to know us. We talked about that last week. We become our, our greatest enemy. And what's behind that? Well, it's the fear that if you know me really, you won't love me. That's what's underneath that. And so I just challenge us again to enter into Christian relationships and be that person who loves people freely so that they too will feel drawn in to know you and for you to know them. The crazy thing now in our day, we see it uh, in social media, particularly among a younger group. I was reading a study this week about how the impact of, of social media on anxiety and, and suicide ideation among young people and girls in particular. And here's what happens on social media. We want to put our best self out there. Okay, what's happening with, with, with so many on, on Instagram. Here's my best life. Here's what I'm doing. Look at, how, look at me. Use this filter. Look how great I look. And what's happening, there's this insidious cycle because we know I'm putting that out there. Okay, I'm being liked. I'm really being liked. I'm being loved now. But we know that's not really us. We're putting out a false self. I'm not really loved because that's not really me. You see how it's just playing into the minds of all of us. And what happens for every single one of us, though, is this need to be honest and open before the Lord and with one another. It's why Christian friendships... And maybe it's just one or two in the end. Maybe it's a connect group where you meet up with a couple of other people and now you're able to, to really talk about your life. We say you're only as sick as your secrets. And bringing your life, even your sin, out into the open, into the light will set you free. And you start to learn, I really am loved. But you won't know until then. We continue to hide out, but this is what the body of Christ is for. And an application for some of us today, listen, is for you to join the fellowship of our church. Prove that you're not going to hide anymore. Prove that you're not going to hide anymore. Join one of our connect groups. I'm going to step out in courage for some of us to be great courage to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to really get to know people here and not just show up and leave. And that's a real challenge for all of us because we're here, friends. We're a church 
We're not just a gathering on Sunday morning. We do life together, and I've seen it at its best in our connect groups. Even this week, I've seen it. And so look at verse 59. Let's keep pressing on. Now, the chief priest and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, at last, two came forward. Now, here's what's going on. Again, an illegitimate trial in many, uh, many, uh, at many points. Jesus is his own defense. He doesn't have, have any defense. He's his own defense. Um, we also know they're trying to get two people to agree who had to be present at the place, hearing, seeing the same thing. Either folks are scared or they can't find two people to agree on something. They're trying to pin him with something, again, where they can uh, really bring about capital punishment, even bring it to the Romans. So not just a religious thing, they're trying to find something on him. They're bringing interviews in all night long, trying to find two people who could corroborate, and finally they do. And look at the charge they run with. This is really interesting. Verse 61. And said, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple and to rebuild it in three days. What? And and then, then it says, and the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? Like, bring a defense. What are are you saying? What is it that these men testify against you? And Jesus remains silent. He has a secret ambition, we know. But what they're hoping is punishable by death. Watch this. If you've been to Israel, um, there's a model that you go see and look at the old, you know, the temple grounds. And you can see the the ruins where these things were. But but there was a Roman garrison that Herod the Great built on, right, right on the wall, the corner of a wall of the temple. And it was a part of the temple grounds. This, this garrison was named the Antonia Fortress. Okay, after his patron, Mark Antony. You probably heard that name. So to destroy the temple was to destroy the Roman garrison that had Roman soldiers in it. So now we've got something. It's a stretch, but not really. And it also corroborates with the whole triumphal entry narrative. Jesus is showing up in Jerusalem and people are claiming, proclaiming him king. And he doesn't seem to be denied. It. So now it's starting to come together. We're going to push this thing all the way to Pilate where we can ultimately have him killed. Look at this. Jesus is seen, but he's not known. So that, watch this, in Christ we are seen and known and loved by him. Watch this. We also see this. He experienced for us. He was heard, but not understood. So Jesus finally speaks. He makes two statements. I've noted verse 61. He's saying this man claims he can, uh, you know, is going to destroy the temple and rebuild it. Now he's referencing his body, of course. Think about that. The very location of the presence of God in the person of Jesus. While he was on earth, he was the temple of God. He says, I'm going to, this temple will be, you know, torn down. It'll be, I'll be ultimately killed, but I'll raise it up again in three days. My father will raise me up. He's talking about his resurrection. He's heard, but misunderstood. In verse 62, the high priest, you know, says, come on, you've got to answer this. You offer a defense, but he remains silent. Look at verse 63. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you, okay, order you, command you. By the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, now he speaks, you have said so. All right, so here's what he's doing here. The language is such, helps us here. But he says, "Uh, that's how you say it. Now let me say it. You say it one way, I'm going to say it this. I tell you. From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He is saying, I have more authority and power than you can even imagine. I am more than you can handle. You think I'm a Messiah. I am the supreme authority and judge of the universe. And Caiaphas knows he's saying that, even through this colorful language. He knows exactly what he's saying, and Caiaphas loses his mind. Look at verse 65. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? 
You have now heard his blasphemy. So Jesus confirms what they're saying, but he's got a different emphasis, a much greater emphasis. And friends, here's the thing. We too can make the mistake of, of worshiping a Jesus, if you will, who, who agrees with us. He's just like us. Uh, we, we, we tell you who he is. He likes all the people I like. He votes like me. He, he hates the people I hate too. We, we created Jesus of our own making. And it's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's what's happening here. How do we know him? Through his word. Are you in his word? Constantly being reminded of who he is. And another application here again is we too are heard and misunderstood. We we all have found ourselves in, and and some of us in certain groups of people in our culture can feel, feel maybe heard and not understood or maybe not heard. I was talking to a young mom this week who felt kind of isolated, like, I don't often feel like I'm hurt or I don't have a voice anymore or some of our older members within our church where you can be a part of our in-home ministry to go to people and say, you matter, you're a key member of our church and your voice matters, you are seen and you are heard. It's what our deacons do as we serve, but you can do the same. You know, reach out to us. We want you to find a place where you can serve. Maybe you're a person who's a minority in certain contexts. You feel like you, you're not heard or understood. I, I know some, some people I've talked to, to folks within our church, you might imagine as a pastor, same sex attracted, who are wrestling with sexual identity and sometimes feel unseen or unheard or misunderstood. So what, what do we do about that? We, like Jesus, we come and say, listen, I want to hear you. I see you. I want to hear more about your story. You're loved here. And, and, and let us guide you to Jesus because here's the truth. When you feel like this, don't let it drive you to despair. Let it drive you to Jesus. Because in Christ, here it is, we are heard and understood. This is the beauty of being in Christ. And then the final interaction as we set our hearts towards the table, he was judged but not accepted. Imagine this, the judge of every heart on the planet, every heart who will ever live, the judge at the white throne judgment will judge every heart based on what we have done with him. He's now being judged by sinful people. And look at verse 66. What is your judgment? They answered him. I mean, they answered, he deserves death. Then they, imagine this, spit in his face and they struck him. That word struck is, is literally closed up, knuck, it's knuckles, closed fist. They're hitting him and the language is over and over again in the face. It's knuckles to face and one commentator jumped from here to Isaiah 52 where it says that the Messiah, his face was marred beyond human recognition. He jumps there now before the flogging, before the cross. Jesus is taking on our punishment already. Some slapped him, prophesy to us, you Messiah, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Can you imagine? The ultimate judge of the universe is being judged by sinful people. You know, here's the thing, the uh, part of the application. We live in a fallen world. Let's be honest, you and I are judged. We're judged all the time. You're judged by the color of your skin. You're judged by what you're wearing. You're judged by where you live, judged by what you have, judged by how you act or all of the, I mean, let's be honest, right? Let's don't pretend like that's not happening, but here's the flip side of that. We too judge people. But when we're in Christ, because he has taken on all of our condemnation, we are known and loved by him. We don't judge people like that anymore. We don't judge people according to the color of their skin. We don't judge people according to where they live or what they're wearing or even how they act. Even Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, I don't judge myself anymore. I am only judged by the one who matters. The ultimate judge who says, I'm loved, I'm forgiven, I've been released of all sin. I may live in a fallen world, but I live in a different way altogether. So in Christ, we are judged and accepted. The ultimate judge embraces us and he loves us. You see how this is applied to real life? 
the ultimate judge who matters. He, he, he's the one who says we have been set free because his body was broken for us, his blood shed for us. Friends, we're no longer afraid. We can love others for free without any need for love in return. Because as it says in 1 John 4, 18, perfect love cast out fear. And listen, because fe- he goes on to say fear has to do with punishment. But we're no longer fearful of punishment. Because Christ in him, he has taken on our punishment so that we have been set free. So just a few days later, well, how about this? The next day, Christ would go to the cross, would be our ultimate substitute. And he would die on the cross for our sins. His body broken for us, his blood shed for us. A few days later, he would be raised up again. And friends, this judge, this time, he raises up victorious. And every one of us, will stand before the ultimate judge someday. And friends, if you're, if you're thinking that you're gonna rely on your own righteousness to stand before a holy God, you are mistaken and you need to decide today to give your life to him. And so what I wanna do is just pray and, and ask the Lord to guide you. If you've never received his grace, I wanna do that now. And if you've never, never accepted his love, do that now, even as we set our hearts on his sacrifice for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that in you, we have a substitute who's taken on our sin for your righteousness. The great exchange that we were and are guilty of sin. You were innocent, but you have given us your righteousness. Thank you for forgiving us. My friend, if you've never received Christ or you want to settle that today, right now, by faith, say, yes, I believe. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I receive your grace. Be Lord of my life. Lord, thank you that in you we are seen and known. And and in you we are heard and understood. And in you, we're we're judged and yet accepted, found innocent. All because of what you've done for us on the cross. So Lord, we give you even this time and we pray that you'll bless it as we serve one another and remember what you've done for us in Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen.